All right, hi everyone. Welcome. So thank you to our audience today and to our speakers that are here. We have an incredible panel with very diverse experiences and close connections to the Philippines. Um, and the topic of today's webinar, which is US militarization of the Philippines and the abuse of local communities and of the environment. So I am the coordinator of Code Pink's China is Not Our Enemy campaign, and we advocate for demilitarization of the Asia Pacific, which is mainly conducted in the name of containing China. Um, and these, and these, oh, sorry, I just got a notification, okay. Um, and these actions, um, in many instances, including in the Philippines, have led to human rights abuses and the destruction of protected lands. So billions and billions of dollars have gone into hypermilitarization yeah. of the Asia Pacific, and our government wants to send even more money. They're currently working on passing the PARA Act, which would allot another $2.5 billion to U.S. military buildup in the Philippines. And it's not just weapons and bases and troops. The U.S. has conducted covert operations against China, which has negatively affected the Filipino people. Just recently, it was revealed that the Pentagon conducted a secret anti-vax operation in the Philippines in an attempt to minimize China's influence in the region and reduce trust in China's medical supplies. And this was at a time when thousands of people were dying each day. Um, and military officials involved in the campaign admitted that they weren't concerned about public health at all, and they were merely trying to drag China through the mud. So it's clear that the U.S. hybrid war against China is already having severe repercussions for innocent people in the Philippines and will continue to as long as it occurs. And a war with China is something that nobody wants to see because it's something many, many people won't walk away from and maybe all of us. So that's why it's more important now than ever to stand up for peace and remind people that the enemy is war, not China. And it's also critical to address how U.S. policy in the region, in the Philippines, is ongoingly harmful to the planet and to the Filipino people, which is what we're here to talk about today. So our first speaker, Alia Lucegro, is the Outreach Coordinator at the National Priorities Project, serving as Project Manager for Growing Collaboration with Immigrants, Rights Organizations, and Movements Against Climate Change. As a first-generation immigrant, Alia has roots in the Philippines and is now based in DC. She's going to talk a bit about the US conception of national security, the extremely high US military budget, and how China is being used as a tool to promote harmful policy in the region. Let me just share my screen real quick. Oh, wow. Yeah, she did. All right, is it is it sharing? Not yet, Megan. Due to the spike in patients as Israel intensifies its attack across the territory. Only 10 of 26 UN healthcare facilities in Gaza remain operational. On Wednesday, the top UN aid coordinator for Palestine, Mohammed Hadi, said women and girls in Gaza are facing harrowing. Somebody conditions. needs to mute. And everything is a challenge in Gaza. Okay, I'm just trying to figure out how to share my screen. Um, the button's not working more. Katrina, what button did you press to share your screen? So beside, like on mine, beside the react button, there's a button that says share and it's green. And when I press that, it shows me my different windows that I okay. can choose from. Did it work? Yes, yes. 
Okay, well, good. Okay, let me press play. Okay, Aliyah, take it away. Awesome. Um, thank you so much, um, Megan and Code Pink. And uh, I'm so excited to be here with my fellow panelists to talk about US militarization in the Philippines. Um, and it's a huge issue. So um, yeah, today, um, as Megan said, I'll be talking about the bu budget, um, this notion of national security that is driving uh, militarization in this country and um, of the Philippines, and also just talking about how militarization um, yeah, manifests as uh, exercises, bases, all of that. Um, next slide, please. So just to give a background on what the National Priorities Project is and does, we're a federal budget research organization um, based in Washington, DC, and we're housed under Institute for Policy Studies, which is a progressive policy think tank. Um, and how we define militarism is mainly in three areas. We define it as one, <laughs> Pentagon and war and weapons. Uh, number two, border enforcement. So agencies responsible for deportations and detentions, such as ICE and CBP. And then number three, law enforcement. So pol policing and prisons. Um, and we look at the budget and have a special eye out for how much the military um, consists of the federal budget because it's a lot. It's colossal and it funds militarism here at home, at our borders, um, you know, this whole concept of borders, and then um, internationally also. Um, and so in 2023, out of uh, $1.8 trillion federal discretionary budget, uh, about 62% was for militarism. So all of those areas that I just um, explained to you. Um, next slide, please. And then uh, also just to go back to that chart, um, that remaining 38% is for everything else. So everything that our true human needs, societal programs, um, such as housing, education, healthcare, climate justice for a just transition. Um, and not a lot goes enough to all of those many things that we need. So another way um, to say this is out of every $5, $3 is going to the military. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then also important to this conversation um, is acknowledging that for every $1 that the US has spent on diplomacy um, and humanitarian foreign aid in 2023, it spent $16 on the military and war. So yeah, just um, we can see in a budget, like it is essentially a moral document um, as the Poor People's Campaign says, um, where our money is, is where our priorities lie. Um, and this is all from a report that we did called the war, the warfare state, where we talked about military spending in um, 2023. So you can go check that out. Um, next slide, please. So um, yeah, just to get into um, just the conception of national security for the U.S. Um, and how that's rooted in state violence um, and how all of the ideologies that I'm about to say and, and um, as my fellow panelists will say later, all of the issues and problems, um, it really drives the war machine. So just to elaborate it some more, um, in escalating like international conflicts or tensions for the US, war is the norm and building up the military is the norm, um, and this is damaging. So um, basically, uh, just to be a global power, the US um, wants a stronger army um, in the hopes that um, it has deterrence power over other countries. And then this drives up uh, military spending, um, and then we can't have money for anything else. And it also just has damaging influence to other countries. Um, 
And this is especially true for China because it's seen as uh, a great power, um, great competitive power um, to the US. Um, and so that's one thing. And then you pair it with other issues um, that the US has um, and you pair it with like views of like, oh, like other countries are public health threats. So that's um, what we saw in the language and the media on the COVID-19 pandemic, or you see it with other, um, or reasons of like, oh, just political systems are incompatible or our political system is better. Um, and so all of these re reasons um, drive up military spending and the answer is to militarize um, everywhere, like everywhere. Um, and so, yeah, it's important to underscore that there are uh, racist and xenophobic assumptions um, underneath all of these that maintain white supremacy, it maintains capitalism, it maintains uh, patriarchy, like really oppressive systems. Um, and then next slide, please. Um, but just to um, take a turn um, into the more hopeful realities, um, we know that there are ways of living in cultures there, uh, that don't depend on violence or military to maintain relationships, to live, to thrive. Um, I think about uh, Pacific nations and cultures, think about US occupied Hawaii, I think about the Philippines. Um, and the Philippines, um, just to yeah, just to talk more about it, it's so abundant with natural resources. Um, but other countries have, you know, extracted from our people and our land for a long time for their own games, uh, gains. And so I bring up this quote from a prominent um, leader, activist, uh, artist, um, uh, Jose Maria Sison or Amado Guerrero is uh, the pen name. So it says, if the natural wealth of the Philippines were to be tapped and developed by the Filipino people themselves for their own benefit, it would be more than enough to sustain a population that is several times bigger than the present one. Um, yeah, just wanna like sit with that. Like um, the Philippines culture is so beautiful. It has so much um, and I would like love to get into all of that, um, but yeah, just, it's so rich with resources and unfortunately through like history, it's been extracted from and also uh, militarization has had negative impacts on the environment. Next slide, please. Uh, and yeah, I'll just be getting into um, US militarization and militarism in the Philippines. Uh, next slide, please. So the Philippines is one of the largest recipients of US military funding in the region, in the Southeast Asia region, the Indo-Pacific. Um, and it has become increasingly militarized due to the US-China dynamics in the region. Um, so just to lay out some more numbers. Um, according to the Foreign Assistance uh, website um, from the US State Department and USAID, in 2022, the US gave $340 million to the Philippines. And about $120 million of this is for the military. Um, and that's a lot. Um, and then, over the years since 2015, the US has given uh, billions of dollars in military aid to the Philippines. And um, as some of us may know, this uh, there is a drive to increase this. Um, and then, yeah, just a few months ago, um, there have been bills in US Congress where um, they want to increase more military funding to the Philippines. So um, there was one where 
uh, it would give $500 million per year for the next five years, which is $2.5 billion overall. Um, and next slide, please. Um, so this money, it would um, build up military personnel, will build up um, construction of the bases, um, um, exercise, and here at National Priorities Project, what we like to look at is where could that money go? What can we do with $2.5 billion? Um, so we have a trade-off calculator on our website, and I just pulled some numbers, but $2.5 billion could provide um, housing for nearly 260,000 individuals or families early education access for 195,000 children, healthcare for 506,000 low-income adults, or solar power for 6.21 million households. So that money could do a lot. Next slide, please. Um, and going into U.S. spaces. So I like to bring up um, this resource from worldbeyondwar.org. They have um, this really cool tool where they map bases um, all over the world. And I know there are different like sources and tools out there that um, maps. So this is definitely one of them. And it lists uh, 13 bases in the Philippines. Next slide, please. And I just want to um, highlight this example of the Clark Air Force Base. Um, it's on the Luzon um, Island, um, kind of near Manila, uh, just a few like provinces out. Um, but basically, um, this is a prime example of toxic waste and contamination in a base. So this is a base that's now closed. Um, it was closed in 1992. Um, and after it was closed, the World Health Organization did this report where um, basically they found a lot of toxic waste in the base with lead, aviation fuel, uh, radioactive materials. Um, and then the year after, in 1994, there was an environmental organization that campaigned to hold the U.S. accountable for this mess, um, but uh, they didn't really address the mess. Um, it wasn't until six years later that they donated money to the Philippines to um, quote unquote foster a cleaner and more productive environment. Um, but it's specifically not for um, this space and we don't really know where that money went. And then also in 1991, there was an eruption in Mount Pinatubo, which is a volcano um, in the area. And so refugees took shelter in this space, but without the knowledge of the contamination, they drank the water, which caused long-term health complications. Um, and again, the US did not um, take any responsibility for it. Um, and they stated an agreement from like 1947, where they said that, um, yeah, between the Philippines and the US, they don't have any responsibility for restoring any um, basis to their original conditions, which is, yes, a shame. Um, and then one last thing. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, I just wanna bring up this um, recent and groundbreaking investigation um, that Megan um, included in the intro about how the US military can conducted widespread disinformation about um, China's uh, Sinovac um, vaccine in uh, the Philippines. Basically, um, what happened was there were a lot of uh, bot accounts on X, formerly Twitter, stating that the virus, you know, is China and not to tr trust this um, vaccine. And next slide, please. Um, and this is just an example of what it said with an English translation on the right side. So basically discrediting um, China for 
the vaccine. Um, and if you read the entire uh, investigation, it's truly wild. They um, There were a lot of like posts about there being um, pork gelatin vaccines to dissuade Muslims from taking it. And um, as some of us may know, um, there are a lot of Muslims in the Philippines. Um, it's one of the largest religions uh, practiced there. And this was all, you know, to um, the U.S. feared uh, China's growing influence in the region, especially their COVID diplomacy. Um, and even in this year, uh, the Pentagon budget dedicated money towards influence operations um, against other countries, including what um, we are assuming this psyops um, or psychological uh, operation. And so this is really sad and wild and it just costs civilian lives and the growing distrust for vaccines in general. And so that is all I have. Um, and definitely not comprehensive of how US militarization shows up in the Philippines. Um, but yeah, thank you. And I'm looking forward to hearing from my fellow panelists. Thank you so much, Alia. Um, so next we have um, our speaker, Abby Erodistan. She is the Secretary General of Gabriella USA, which is a grassroots-based alliance of progressive Filipino women's organizations in the US. She is a second-generation Filipino born in Watsonville with a background in crisis mental health work. She was first engaged in the National Democratic Movement for the Philippines through student organizing, but found her home in organizing the women's sector. And today she's going to talk about the U.S. militarization's impact on women currently and historically, as well as discuss the findings of the Biden Peace Mission. Thank you, Megan. Um, and thank you to Code Pink, everyone who's here, and of course, my fellow panelists. Um, yes, my name is Abby. I am the Secretary General of Gabriella USA, um, and we'll just go ahead and get into it. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. Uh, yeah, so just a quick overview of what I'll be discussing today. I'll be talking a little bit about the history of U.S. militarization um, so that we can understand the context of how we've gotten to this what? position and how... Um, the U.S. has actually been- I just been, grabbed it for the room. Um, sorry, <laughs> how the U.S. has been consistently um, militarizing the Philippines for over a hundred years actually, and what it looks like now, and then connecting it to some of the campaigns that Gabriella USA has been engaging in um, throughout this summer. So we'll go into the next slide. Yes, so um, if you may or may not know, um, the U.S. first came to the Philippines about over 100 years ago, um, actually 125 years this, this year, technically, um, during the Philippine-American War after Spain, quote, sold the Philippines as a colony to the U.S. along with other countries at that time. The U.S. came and tried to conquer the Philippines, and the Filipino people said, we won't have it, we won't have a new colonizer, um, and the Philippine-American War was waged. It was a really brutal war. Um, they had different, like, uh, really depraved orders, like, kill every Filipino above the age of 10, um, and were so incredibly violent to the Filipino people, and there's some estimate of about 200,000 Filipino civilians who died during this, but the real estimate is actually much higher because during this time there was also famine, hunger, and disease that killed more and more Filipinos and um, believed to be up to a million Filipinos who died in what is essentially the genocide of the Filipino people um, during this time. And so from that time on, the U.S. continued this colonization and occupation of the Philippines up until World War II, um, when the Japanese Empire came in and occupied the Philippines, and the U.S. abandoned the Filipino people, um, not to say that they were ever protecting them in the first place, uh, but they, you know, were busy 
fighting front war fronts all over the world and uh, abandoned the Philippines to the Japanese empire, who was also incredibly brutal to the Filipino people, especially Filipino women. And there are still very many uh, Filipino comfort women who are still seeking justice from this per period of time. And then the U.S. came back. I will say also, it was not the U.S. coming back to save the Philippines from Japan, but the Filipino people themselves, particularly the armed struggle of the Hukbalahap, um, who liberated themselves from Japanese colonization, but the U.S. came back, recolonized, and then granted this sham independence to the Philippines in 1946. We can go to the next slide. So in after 1946, um, even though the U.S., Again, who's the U.S. to say that they can just grant another country their independence? Um, but after they granted independence to the Philippines, it was very clear that the U.S. wasn't going to just walk away from the Philippines um, and say, you can do whatever you want. You are truly an independent, free country. Uh, immediately after the U.S. was making moves to establish military control over the Philippines, um, because the Philippines, like Aliyah had said, is an incredibly resource-rich country. It's in a very strategic place in the Asia-Pacific region. And so the U.S. saw this opportunity to strengthen its military agreement. Uh, uh, control over the Philippines. And so if you look at the right of the slide, you'll see some of the different military agreements that were made between the U.S. and the Philippines that are actually incredibly unequal. And even during this time, there were still many Filipino people who rejected these agreements and rejected specifically the establishment of U.S. military bases. And in 1991, Bayan uh, Philippines campaigned to kick out the U.S. military bases and was successful, actually. Um, it's actually unconstitutional and against the Constitution of the Philippines to have U.S. military bases. But the U.S. government, alongside the Philippine puppet governments, worked together to establish new military agreements that would kind of bypass or create loopholes that allowed the U.S. military to come back and establish its presence in a way that's not as official or as clear as U.S. military bases, but is still very much in, uh, welcoming back U.S. military into the Philippines. And so uh, agreements like the Visiting Forces Agreement, um, the Mutual Logistics Support Agreement, and especially the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement, which was signed in 2013 after Obama announced the Pivot to Asia War Strategy um, to counter China. These agreements have solidified and brought back the presence of U.S. military in the Philippines. And so as covert as they want it to be, we also are very aware that this has been um, moves that have been made by the U.S. and the Philippines to strengthen their relationship, but especially by U.S. imperialist interests. We can go to the next slide. Um, one of the things that we in Gabriella really also highlight is that the presence of U.S. military in the Philippines results in violence against Filipino women. And not only this violence, but the inability for Filipino women to even achieve any kind of accountability or justice for the crimes that are committed against them. And so I'm gonna highlight two specific cases. Um, the first is the Subic rape case of 2005. Um, Subic base, naval base is a US military base area in the Philippines. And in 2005, there was a US Marine named Daniel Smith who was charged with rape by a Filipino woman. Um, and the Philippine Supreme Court basically ruled that he, you know, ruled that he was guilty, but then the visiting forces agreement allowed for him to actually not be held in a Philippine jail or a Philippine holding facility and allowed him to stay with the U.S. embassy. Um, and eventually, you know, the the victim would recant her testimony, likely because she saw that there was really no future for getting any kind of accountability from a U.S. soldier uh, for the, the crime that was committed against her. Um, there's also the case of Jennifer Laude. Uh, she was a trans Filipino woman who was murdered by U.S. Marine Joseph Scott Pemberton. Um, the U.S. sought custody of Pemberton, even though he was found guilty in the Philippine courts. And it was a very large campaign to get justice for Jennifer Laude to hold uh, Joseph Scott Pemberton um, accountable to his crimes. But because of the case that happened in 2005, he was not 
um, he was not liable to be held in a Philippine facility. They wanted to put him in the Belibid prison, which is um, a really big prison for Filipino criminals, and he was not required to be held there. They actually constructed his own jailhouse for him um, by the U.S. Embassy and then was eventually pardoned by President Duterte in 2020 on good conduct, um, whatever that means. And so we know that uh, it's actually these military agreements that make it nearly impossible for women to, one, live safely in the Philippines, but also to be able to get any kind of justice, any kind of accountability. Um, so these military agreements have a huge, huge impact on top of other impacts as well. We'll go into the next slide. So some of the more current effects of U.S. militarization in the Philippines, uh, one of the one thing that happens every year is this thing called the Balikatan exercises or these shoulder to shoulder shoulder to shoulder exercises between the U.S. and the Philippines. But they also include other countries, militaries like I think this year they included France and Australia and maybe Japan. Um, but they do these military exercises in the Philippines. These are not the only military exercises that happen, but these are the biggest. They have upwards of 17,000 to 18,000 soldiers in the Philippines practicing these different um, military exercises. And in May, um, some members of Bayan USA, of which uh, is a, another progressive alliance that Gabriela is a part of, of, of Filipino organizations, sent a peace delegation to the Philippines to conduct some research on how the people were being impacted by um, the military bases and by the Balikatan exercises. And some of the very initial findings they found were um, the, the public was not informed ahead of time about these exercises. They were just knocked on the door maybe day of and said, oh, by the way, we're going to be detonating bombs in your neighborhood, right? Um, there was a fishing ban for the fishermen who are um, it, who were in the northern Philippine areas um, where these exercises happen. And so they were banned from their ability to access their own livelihood for about 10 days. And the government gave little to no help to any of them. Um, they also use Filipino civilians, property, etc., for their exercises. Um, stories of Filipino civilians having to carry U.S. soldiers for their disaster relief exercises. Um, there's a sense of normalization of war or already feeling as if they are at war for a lot of the locals in the Philippines. They can't tell between what is what is real war and what is happening with these military exercises, because really it's the same thing. Um, and so even though, you know, there's this sense of we're getting closer to war for a lot of Filipinos, they already feel like they are at war. There's, of course, the environmental impacts that Aliyah shared. And then we also view these military exercises as a way to heighten these, the tensions with China um, by using the Philippines as a launching pad for war. So you can go to the next slide. Um, so I have here two maps. Uh, on the left, you'll see this kind of outline of the, what the West Philippine Sea is, um, or the territory of the Philippines, which is the Filipino people's territory 100%, and China has no right to come in and claim it for their own. Um, and you'll see that's where a lot of the tension is happening. Uh, there has been a lot of stories in the news lately of China and Philippines clashing with each other, um, and specifically Filipino fishermen who are being hurt by these Chinese um, ships and these Chinese soldiers. And we 100% condemn it for the Filipino people because of the way that China has been encroaching on Philippine sovereignty. We 100% condemn China and reject China's encroachment in the Philippines. But we also know that the real reason why they are getting closer and closer is because the U.S. has been instigating this conflict and using the Philippines as a pawn in its war game. And so if you look at the map on the right side, um, you'll see all of the different military bases. Um, these are EDCA sites, so the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement, which basically allows U.S. soldiers to be housed in, mili in Philippine military facilities. So they don't have technically their own base, so it's not technically unconstitutional, but they are effectively U.S. military bases. And you'll see, um, if you look where they e are even located, it's really on the islands that are ready to posture against China in the West Philippine Sea. And so 
it's important for us to know that, yes, we condemn China's aggression in the West Philippine Sea. Yes, we condemn China's um, violence against the Filipino fishermen, especially, but it isn't without the cause of the who who was putting the Philippines in this position in the first place. And especially when you consider how little the Filipino people have, how low their wages are, how high inflation is. And the, and the Marcos regime is willingly uh, playing into the hands of the U.S. imperialists and putting the Filipino people into this war. This is not what they need. They don't want to be in the middle of a war. And so if you go to the next slide, um, this is why for us, we say... Uh, Atinang Pinas, U.S. at China layas, or the Philippines is ours, U.S. and China get out. And this is a, a picture from some fishermen who are in near the West Philippine Sea who are tired of being used as pawns, tired of being used as collateral damage by the U.S. and by China. Um, so if you go to the next slide. This all connects um, to some of the campaign work that Gabriela USA, alongside many other Filipino organizations, have been participating in. Um, so the Cancel RIMPAC campaign, RIMPAC, which is this huge joint military exercises between 29 different countries, including the Philippines, the U.S., and even countries like, or I should say, quote, countries, it's really not, a, it's an occupation, but Israel also participates in RIMPAC. And it's yet another opportunity for the U.S. to try and flex its military might in the Pacific, Asia Pacific region at the expense of the people, especially the occupied nation of Hawaii. Um, we also participated in the Resist NATO campaign or the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, um, which is this U.S.-led military alliance that says it's for protecting peace or promoting peace, but really it's about uh, expanding military control and military might by the U.S. all over the world. So even though they say they are, you know, the North Atlantic, um, they have partner countries all over the world and are trying to increasingly uh, expand their influence in, in the Philippines as well. And then we also participate in the Reject Para Act. And I know Code Pink has a campaign also to reject the Para Act, which is the Philippines Enhanced Resiliency Act, um, which would expand more U.S. military aid to the Philippines, actually $2.5 billion for the next five years. And there's even a representative of the U.S., um, Representative Daryl Issa from San Diego, who wants to add another $500 million on top of the Para Act. And so at all of the different actions um, against NATO, against RIMPAC, our organizations also were advocating to reject the Para Act. And so I think there are some Code Pink chapters who also have been participating in these campaigns all over the country, and there's been different echo actions all over the country. And so we're really seeing the importance to heighten and strengthen our anti-war movement because we know that if war breaks out, the people who are going to in feel the impacts first are going to be the everyday masses, the working class people, the peasantry, the fishermen, especially in the Philippines. And so, um, yeah, we have been engaging in these campaigns. They're still ongoing and especially Reject Para Act. We are calling on all of our allies to continue to help us to reject para um, and to fight against a US led war. And then if you go to the last slide, um, if you want to also express your support with us on the streets, uh, we have a call to action um, every year, Marcos, has this state of the nation address where he says all these fluffy words about how great the Philippines is doing, how amazing he is as president, but we know that's not true. And we can see it in the everyday suffering of the Filipino people, the working class, the peasantry, the fishermen, the students, the women, right? And so uh, we are holding people's state of the nation addresses all over the country. Um, we have them in Chicago, Seattle, Los Angeles, New York, Washington, DC, San Francisco, Honolulu, and Portland. Um, and so these flyers are here if you want to uh, learn more and I can link the Instagram page that has more about the times and places. Um, but our main call this year is Soberanya, Kabuhayan, Servicio at Karapatan, Ipaglaban, Singilin at Panagutin ang Rehimeng U.S. Marcos, or Sovereignty, Livelihood, Services, and Rights. Let's fight for them, right? Um, charge and hold accountable the U.S. Marcos regime. So if you'd like to uh, join us on the streets, you're feeling outraged about the situation of the Philippines and how Marcos has been allowing for this to happen and growing uh, or 
grabbing the Filipino people and putting them into this position instead of meeting their needs, uh, we invite you to join us on the streets for PISONA, um, happening in just a couple days all over the country. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abby. Um, so we have Katrina who's gonna share her screen next. Um, we have our last speaker is the incredible Brandon Lee, a human rights and environmental activist who worked with the Eagle Rot indigenous people in the Philippines in 2010. And he was targeted for assassination by the US backed Duterte regime, which left him paralyzed from the chest down. And nowadays, Brandon is a member of the International Coalition for Human Rights in the Philippines and is speaking out for peace and justice. So he's gonna talk about the situation in the Philippines, the People's War, the International People's Tribunal, along with his own experiences and what our role is now here in the US. Hi, thank you, Megan. Um, thank you, Cole Pink and the panelists and everyone in attendance. Um, I'm just gonna start off with letting you know that the International Coalition for Human Rights in the Philippines it's a global network uh, operating in 15 countries. It's made up of organizations concerned about human rights uh, situation in the Philippines and committed to campaign for a just and lasting peace in the country. It aims to inform the international community about the grave human rights situation in the Philippines today. So next slide. Mm -hmm. So um, the Philippines is a semi-colonial um, state. Um, next slide. Um, it's, as we have heard from Abby about the history of the 125 years of direct and indirect US rule and imperialism that led to the unequal agreements like the Visiting Forces Agreement um, and the recent enhanced defense cooperation agreement that allowed for the US military to come back um, to the Philippines. Um, but um, just this past November here in San Francisco, um, 21 world leaders around the rim of the Pacific um, met and they discussed these backdoor unequal agreements and one of these unequal agreements was passed in 1995, and that's called the Mining Act of 1995. It allowed like unbridled mining um, coming in from the U.S. into indigenous uh, communities, um, allowing 100% profit from the plunder of indigenous people's land. And um, just recently, um, in that November meeting, uh, Marco shook hands with uh, President Biden over an agreement um, called the One Two Three Nuclear Agreement, and that just allows um, micro nuclear plants to be shipped from the U.S. to the Philippines, and it's untested. And we know uh, what happens with nuclear power when all goes wrong, as we've seen in. Uh, Fukushima in Japan. Um, and yeah, uh, the Philippines is rich with natural resources, like Aliyah pointed out. Um, the U.S. plunders and secures raw materials with the Philippine military and paramilitary forces, known as investment defense forces. Um, the plundering of the resources and, and land is a form of colonial domination. And U.S. backed counterinsurgency program implemented in the Philippines with no respect for international humanitarian law. It's documented several times uh, by multiple um, intergovernment uh, bodies like the United Nations and uh, human rights watchdogs. Um, next slide. So um, there's a bear crack capitalism and the issue of land. Um, the government of the Republic of the Philippines primarily functions to represent the interests of 
U.S. imperialism and global monopoly capitalism. And the GRP or the government of the Republic of the Philippines has no incentive to advance feudal conditions within the Philippines. Amounts to conditions of national oppression, such as the mass poverty, poor wages, and working conditions, and large numbers of urban poor and landless peasant population throughout the country. Next slide. So um, because of all these problems um, and the Philippine government doesn't wanna listen to those issues and they usually send the military and police to counter protests, um, there's been a 55 year long ongoing armed conflict between the um, GRP and the National Democratic Front of the Philippines, um, a revolutionary movement fighting for genuine democracy and self-determination of the Filipino people. And as you see in this map in the middle, um, it's indicated mostly red. It means that 70, 73 provinces of the night, uh, sorry, 83 provinces of the 91 provinces in the Philippines have already um, established a new people's army organizing uh, the Filipino masses um, to uplift um, their concerns when the Philippine government hasn't been doing it. Um, next slide. So just going to briefly talk about term terminology. So Geneva Convention um, pretty much lays out the rules of engagement, why there are war crimes. And it covers armed conflicts, which um, peoples are fighting against colonial domination and alien occupation and against racist regime in the exercise of their right to self-determination. And it establishes the International Criminal Court, uh, which is an intergovernmental organization um, seated in Hague, Netherlands. It's the first and only permanent international court with jurisdiction to prosecute individuals for international crimes of genocide, um, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and the crime of aggression. And lastly, um, but not least, is or the combat. It just means that anyone who is a civilian or not fighting in a war anymore, incapacitated, like um, already taken hostage, um, and, or is sick, is considered a non-combatant. And it means you cannot do anything to them if, and these are rules of engagement um, that all these countries around the world have signed, including the United States. Um, but we'll see if um, they're, they're following these rules. Next slide. So um, th recently, uh, the International People's Tribunal is a quasi-judicial forum that aims to investigate and address alleged war crimes and violations of international humanitarian law committed by the U.S. supported Marcos Jr. and the Third Day regimes. Um, this tribunal examines various cases filed um, against defendants from and including um, political killings, torture, enforced disappearances, mass arrests, indiscriminate firing, aerial bombings of communities, and other forms of political suppression um, tantamount to crimes against humanity. So this past um, May 17th and 18th, um, the tribunal was held in Belgium. And on the 18th, the International People's Tribunal ruled um, in Brussels 
uh, that the U.S. backed Philippine government has violated human rights and committed war crimes against the Filipino people. And the lead tribunal juror and former U.S. counsel for Nelson Mandela, Lennox Hines, noted that the evidence presented was credible and consistent and demonstrated a pattern of willful murder and torture of combatants and civilians, arbitrary arrests and indiscriminate bombings of houses and schools. And in this photo, you'll see on the left, Yofemia Kulamat, who is a woman peasant farmer, um, Alumat woman peasant farmer, who is a former congresswoman for Bayan Muna. And she testified during this International People's Tribunal about how the military disregarded um, her, her daughter because they just savagely um, stood over her body and uh, took pictures with um, with the body and the the weapons that she carried and smiled for the photo and that's um, and most likely she was caught alive so there's there's marks of torture on her body which is not uncommon for what the Philippine military does to those who are forced to combat or non-combatants anymore. And on the right side is um, uh, the teacher Rose Hayahai. Um, she's a Luma teacher who taught alongside um, Chad Boak. Um, next slide. Um, pretty much uh, Lumats don't have their own schools or they had to build their own schools because the government doesn't provide them that education. They don't provide them the schools. So when they built their own schools and taught relevant education for their people, how to, um, how to heal their own people, like medicine, um, do organic farming, um, the military ransacked their schools and called it an MPA school or a rebel school, like they're training uh, future rebels. And they harassed the communities. And um, two volunteer teachers, Chad Boak and Jerain, um, were killed uh, along with another health worker. And she's here testifying about it. And to this day, she's afraid of what might happen to her because of um, her will to still teach Lumad students. Okay, um, okay. this is um, on the left side, um, the government of the Philippines, uh, they have a known policy called red tagging which is essentially tagging activists or community members who protest um, development aggression projects or uh, government policies that hurt the people. And they call them terrorists in hopes that activists and community leaders would stop organizing. And in this photo on the left, on the bottom left, it's a photo of myself. Um, they pretty much said that these people in this picture, who are all my colleagues in the Ifugao peasant movement, are part of the New People's Army or rebels. So the Philippine military does not distinguish um, between who is a activist and who is a combatant um, belonging to the New People's Army. Um, which is common in the Philippines. They start threatening, intimidating, um, harassing you, um, putting you under surveillance. And in 2015, I received um, my first death threat in the form of the uh, gamong, which is the 
Ifugao burial blanket for the dead. It was sent as a picture with the um, California idiom, gray May, June gloom, no sky July. And on that envelope, it was addressed to myself and it said my address as uh, my address in Ifugao as well as slash NorCal, um, meaning they did a lot of research on where I was from, uh, Northern California. Um, so yeah, they put me under surveillance. They took my pictures in tricycle, Jeep, and bus terminals. And then um, eventually they searched my bag, um, at when we were going to a, a high political activity and the lights went off. Um, my colleagues told me to close my bag in case the police would um, put um, drugs or bullets or guns into my bag, which is common um, with what the police um, standard operation procedure is for urban poor during their um, drug war, um, which had killed more than 30,000 people under former president Duterte. Um, yeah, then eventually uh, in 19, or sorry, in 2018, um, the Philippine government came out with the NTF LCOC or the National Task Force to end local communist and armed conflict. And that body is um, made up of military and police, um, retired um, colonels and generals. And they uh, marked Ifugao as a province to be neutralized, meaning they will take out any legal organization suspected of supporting the New People's Army, which they identified was the Ifugao peasant movement. My colleagues were killed in 2014, um, William Bugatti and 2018, uh, Ricardo Mayuni. And um, this is to instill fear to those who protested the dams that um, the companies came in to of it off indigenous people's lands and rivers. Um, yeah, and adjacent to us um, in the Chico Dam um, project irrigation, China was also um, trying to uh, trying to develop a uh, pump irrigation project and they only wanted Chinese workers. So it was a Chinese project for um, pretty much China and the people were against that too so it didn't matter if you're a U.S. company or a Chinese company the people were against it because they stand to lose their land and their rivers um, okay and then that next slide is on August 6 um, 2019 um, I was shot by the Philippine military four times, render, rendering me um, a quadriplegic. Um, I cannot use my hands or legs anymore, but I still have my voice, so I choose to still stand with the Filipino people. Next slide. So the verdict was guilty um, on May 18th. Um, the prosecution was able to establish thorough, ample, credible evidence that as part of the counterinsurgency campaign undertaken in the context of the armed conflict, the defendants engaged in the following acts, willful killing, murder of civilians, intentionally directing attacks against civilians and civilian objects, using means and methods of warfare that are indiscriminate by their nature, cause um, uh, superfluous injury and unnecessary suffering, forced displacement of civilian po population, impending humanitarian aid intended for civilians and civilian 
populations. Um, the willful killing of MPA fighters already render or the combat, torture and other forms of cruel degrading inhuman treatment, um, abductions and enforced disappearances, arbitrary arrests and detention, and deliberate attacks against the civilian subjected of having links of the belligerent party, including the filing of trumped up charges, red tagging, terrorist labeling, and dex designation threats, harassment, and intimidation. So these are all, all constituted as serious violations of treaty and customary international law applicable in armed conflict. In other words, they're all guilty of war crimes. Next slide. Um, so really quickly, the anti-imperialist struggle of the Filipino people led by the National Democratic Front of the Philippines threatens US geo, geopolitical and economic interests in the Asia Pacific. And the US government is responsible for directing, training and arming the government of Republic of the Philippines in its counterinsurgency operations. Next slide. So what is our role as people here in the US? We have a duty to speak out against the actions and policies of the US government that support the suppression of the Filipino people. We must demand that our tax dollars don't go to support human rights violations, especially as basic services are cut at home. So there's the Philippine Human Rights Act um, currently in Congress. It's sponsored by Representative Susan Wild in Pennsylvania. It would do the opposite of the Para Act. It would cut military funding to the Philippine military and police until uh, perpetrators, uh, human rights violators are held accountable. And I urge all of you to check that out, talk to your representatives, um, have your organizations endorse uh, the PHRA, um, check in with ICHRP US and how you can support, join ICHRP US. Um, so we must express our solidarity to the Filipino people and all people around the world and uphold their right to self-determination. Next slide. So next steps. So you can talk to um, Katrina in the chat who's been um, gracing us with um, turning the PowerPoint presentation um, with how to get involved in our campaigns. Um, we're asking everyone to help stop US-backed war crimes here in the Philippines and in Palestine. Um, reject the para. Um, we talked about it extensively with Abby's presentation and pass the PHRA. Yeah, okay, next slide. And follow us on our social media and visit us in our website. Join the US Solidarity Movement for the Philippines. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brandon. And thank you to our audience and our amazing panelists today for coming and speaking on this important topic. And if you check the chat, you'll find some um, other links to um, resources. Um, yeah, so thank you so much.